Here's a game I'm sure you've played before. Somewhere in this image is a person of interest. Here he is. Now you know exactly what he looks like. All you have to do is find him. If you're still struggling, here's a clue. Why are some objects more difficult to find than others? What rules govern our ability to find objects? The main experimental method used to investigate these questions is visual search. In a basic visual search experiment, subjects are told to identify whether a particular object is either present or absent within a given environment. In these examples, the object that the subjects are asked to find is a red vertical line. In each of these situations shown here, the target is able to be distinguished from its surrounding distractor elements based on a single feature. On the left and on the right, the target is the only red object. In the middle, the target is the only vertical object. In each case, the target is trivially easy to find. In a standard visual search experiment, the dependent variable is reaction time, defined as the amount of time that it takes for the subject to correctly identify whether the target is present or absent. The independent variable, known as set size, simply refers to the number of distractor elements present on the screen. As you can see in this graph, reaction times are both very short and importantly, don't increase with set size. In other words, the task is very easy. Finding an object based on a single feature, like colour or orientation alone, is unaffected by the number of elements on the screen. This is known as pop-out, or parallel search performance. Now let's look at situations in which the target can't be distinguished from its environment based on a single feature alone. In these examples, subjects are again instructed to identify whether the vertical red target is present or not. In these situations, however, the target can't be distinguished from its distractor elements based on a single feature alone. That is to say, some distractors are also red, and some are vertical. The target, therefore, is distinguished based on a particular combination or conjunction of features. Again, with reaction time as our dependent variable, and set size as our independent variable, we can now quantify what effect this conjunction search has on performance. The first thing to notice is that performance is faster when the target is present compared to when it isn't there. This is because in cases where the target is actually absent, subjects might need to check every possible location to be sure that it is in fact not there. By contrast, in cases where the target is present, there will be many trials where the subject finds this target and therefore won't need to actually check all possible locations. Consequently, search times will be faster on average. In both cases, search times increased with set size. This linear relationship between reaction time and set size implies that in order to find the target line, subjects must have inspected each line separately. This is known as serial search performance. According to feature integration theory, when one performs a simple search task in which the target is defined by a single feature, be it colour or orientation, the brain accomplishes this by simply registering whether or not the relevant feature dimension is present. This sensory registration is assumed to be an automatic process which requires no effortful processing. 
it is said to be pre-attentive. In cases of conjunctive search, however, such as is required to find the target embedded in the stimulus on the left, instead, the brain employs a top-down process known as the attentional spotlight. Because this process has limited spatial extent, it must check each object in the array separately and serially. Another way of increasing the difficulty of visual search is to manipulate the degree of target distractor similarity. This can be accomplished even in situations in which the target is defined by a single featural dimension. As you can see, when the target is very similar to the dark blue distractors, then reaction times are very slow. However, as one increases the amount of white uniquely contained within the target, performance improves monotonically. This technique can be used to psychophysically map the response characteristics of the underlying diagnostic sensory neurons. In this case, color selective neurons. Part four, compound search. The standard present absent search tasks described so far enable one to establish some of the different processing strategies that the brain might use to segment, search for and identify objects. Compound search tasks, however, enable us to evaluate the extent to which a given feature dimension can guide our search on the one hand, and on the other hand, the extent to which that dimension might even be able to automatically co-opt or capture our attention. Compound search tasks involve a primary stimulus upon which subjects actually base their task and a typically more interesting secondary stimulus. In this slide, the primary stimulus involves orientation and the subject's task requires them to identify whether or not one of those lines is either perfectly horizontal or perfectly vertical. The secondary stimulus, however, is colour. In this particular example, this secondary colour stimulus is actually invariant across all of the objects. Consequently, one is unable to use this colour information to guide one's search. In this case, however, the target line is not only defined by its unique orientation, but by its colour. This pairing of a unique secondary stimulus and the target is known as a congruent search condition. If subjects are able to use this redundant colour information to guide their search for the target orientation, then reaction times should be significantly lower than in neutral conditions. In this example, the unique colour is paired not with the target line, but with a distractor. This is known as an incongruent search condition. It's assumed that if the unique secondary stimulus automatically captures one's attention, then one's attention will be temporarily drawn towards this distractor. And so, performance should be significantly slower than in the neutral condition. That is to say, there will be a search cost. But what about other, more complex or higher level secondary stimulus dimensions, such as human body weight? Are we sensitive to visual differences in body fat? If so, can we use this information to guide our search? Moreover, might thin bodies actually capture our attention? The experiment you performed in class was designed to test these questions. <laughs>